Hello, and welcome to our channel, The Watchful Warrior. I am the watchful wife. We live in New England, and we started questioning the narrative about five or six years ago when we were hiking around the area. And so we wanted to take you on a little journey in this presentation about what we see through our eyes, and hopefully the information can add to the bigger picture of what we see with our history. This is a map of New Hampshire, and this is located in the Northeast region of the United States. The Monadnock region is in the lower left-hand corner where the city of Keene is in the purple. And this is primarily the area that we'll be referring to in this video. Our story begins at Willard Pond. Willard Pond is found in an area between Antrim and Hancock, New Hampshire, and is owned by the National Audubon Society. It's actually New Hampshire's largest owned land that is owned by the Audubon, being 793 acres. And this land was given to the Audubon Society back in 1962 by a woman named Elsa Tudor D. Pierre Fuleyland. And this is one of our favorite hikes in the area. It's fairly secluded. There's a couple of mountains that you can hike up as well as hike around the perimeter of the pond about halfway. And this picture here is taken above Bald Mountain, which has a complete overview of the pond below. And as you can, can see, it's extremely rocky on the top. And the first thing that we noticed when we hiked up Bald Mountain for the first time back around 2015, what really struck us is the just the large number of really strange looking boulders and rocks. And oftentimes we're told that these are related to glaciers that moved through the area billions of years ago. But looking at these rocks that really seemed like something else was going on with these boulders, a lot of them had really strange shapes and some of them looked like they could have been possibly from maybe a larger creature that was fossilized. A lot of the times these rocks have trees growing out of them. And as you can see here, this one's covered in some kind of a lichen. We have come across information that talks about the large boulders being in the shape of turtles, which this picture seems to depict pretty well. And that a lot of times there's quartz stone that's found near them and that possibly there's some kind of energy that's, that was created at one point in time in these areas where there's a lot of rock that is found. A lot of the boulders around the pond are just absolutely enormous. And you can see here this large boulder that's placed upon two other really large boulders. And we just question, you know, how did this get here? Did somebody place this here? They had to be pretty large you know people to be able to lift boulders like this or was it placed by some kind of equipment and then we came across pretty recently about the idea of a meltdown that likely happened over the past couple hundred years and so taking a cl closer look at these pictures we can make some outlines of some bricks in some of these rocks possible bricks so we kind of are led to the conclusion that this could be part of the meltdown that happened. We often would come across rocks that were just cut extremely evenly, and it just kept making us think, did somebody cut this with some kind of tool? But thinking about a meltdown and knowing how brick is pretty even, it would make sense that if that was happening, that some of these rocks could just have a really even cut. And with this one here, if you actually walked up to it, it looks like these two rocks would fit perfectly together. The one being kind of right angular shaped up top and then the other one just sort of would fit right inside of it. One thing that we found very fascinating was the amount of stone walls that we were coming across. And the funny thing was that the stone walls were going up the mountains with us. So 
thinking about what we've learned in school along the way that the new, the stone walls in New England were placed here by primitive farmers when they first came to the area. But thinking about farmers placing stone walls way up on mountains really didn't make any sense. And we started to look into stone walls a little bit, and what we found was that there are actually thousands and thousands of miles of stone walls in New England. There was an estimate that we found that there are at least 250,000 miles of stone walls here in this region. Some of the boulders that are in these walls are absolutely enormous and one little farmer <laughs> trying to plow his land probably couldn't lift a lot of these stones and some of the walls are just really high in areas and the stone are very tightly knit together as well. So with the idea of the meltdown, we're still a little bit confused as how these stone walls kind of fit. Were they actually boundaries for something? Were they part of buildings? We still haven't found really any answer to those questions. So. If you have any ideas, we'd love to hear from you and if you could leave a comment for us in the box below. Most of the rocks here around Willard Pond have this really strange kind of cut to them, almost like a grating sort of appearance. You can kind of see that in the upper left-hand corner. That was another thing that we questioned, you know, why did all these rocks kind of have this appearance? But thinking about it more, it could be from brick, and this one also has a reddish sort of appearance to it. This is another really large boulder that I think you could sort of make out some brick from here too. This is another trail that is really close to Willard Pond, and this is around Mill Pond. And supposedly this stone structure here was left over from a sawmill called Hatch Sawmill, but as you can see, it's kind of tightly knit uh, rock rocks here that could possibly have been brick. So the pond was kind of dammed with that large stone wall, and then this is another section that runs alongside, and you can see there's water going through it, but along the sides there does be, 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 be some kind of brick walls on either side. And here's another example of a tree growing right out from the rocks. So we're not really sure exactly what the sawmill looked like. We haven't been able to come across any old photographs of it. So it does lead us to the conclusion that this was some kind of remnants of the old world. And leaving the area of Willard Ponds, there is a section where water passes under the road, but you can see some rock here. There's a larger wall. It does seem to be reinforced, but all seems to be related to whatever was here before. So heading out of Willard Pond, this is actually a rock that was in New Boston, New Hampshire. And the story goes that during the mid to late 1800s, there were hotels in the area that during the summer months, were tourist destinations, and one of the tourist destinations was to this large glacial erratic known as Frog Rock, which is kind of peculiar to us to think about this being a tourist destination. And right close to Frog Rock are these other really large boulders that aren't in the particular shape of animals, but this one here does lead us to believe that this could be part of the meltdown that occurred because there are some outlines of brick that you can notice in the center. Bridges are another one of our fascinations. We just love driving around New Hampshire looking for different types of bridges. And this one is called Gilsum Stone Arch Bridge, supposedly built in 1862 with this beautiful granite work. And you can see also along the river here that there's just a lot of rock that lines the waterway. 
The next few pictures are of stone bridges found in Hillsboro. Hillsboro has claimed a fame of the birthplace of Franklin Pierce, who is the 14th president of the United States. These bridges were supposedly built in the middle of the 19th century, and the story goes is that they were built by Irish and Scottish masons who had immigrated here. The stonework is just absolutely beautiful, and as you can see, there's just so much rock underneath this bridge, which leads us to question if this is actually a pocket of survival, because the other thing is, with life just being mostly farming back in the 1800s, really, what would be the purpose of building such a beautiful bridge such as this? In Hillsborough is another forest called Fox State Forest that is a really pretty area to walk. It has stone walls and here's an example on the right hand side of a tree that we're finding more and more examples of this. Trees that fall over just with their entire root systems fully intact and it just seems to happen with trees that grow out of this rock. They just don't have enough stabilization. Covered bridges are something that we could do an entire video on. But New Hampshire has 54 surviving bridges. It actually is second to Vermont, which has less than 200. And come to find out, Pennsylvania has the most out of any state in the U.S. with over 200 surviving bridges, or 12% of the world, I believe. A lot of the covered bridges in New Hampshire were built in the 1800s, and they do require a lot of upkeep. But what I have noticed is that many of them are built on these very large stone pilings that you can see here in this picture. So I don't know if the stones were intentional to build the bridges upon or if there was destruction and then the bridges were built on top of what was left. There are a lot of different styles of architecture with these types of bridges. And in New Hampshire, there's at least eight different styles. This is the Ashwillet Covered Bridge in Winchester, New Hampshire. It was built in 1864. And this is an example of Town Lattice Truss. And with a lot of the mysteries that we've heard about surrounding fires and destruction, the covered bridges are not an exception to that as well, that most of the bridges have been destroyed. And if you read up on them, you'll find that a lot of times they were destroyed due to arson. The other thing is that although we think of covered bridges and stone walls <laughs> together in New England, covered bridges are not isolated to New England at all, and actually they can be found all over the world. So Europe has them in Switzerland and Asia as well. This building here is found in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and it's one of the examples of the beautiful brick masonry that is seen. And a lot of these buildings have similar brickwork around the area. You can see the archways or the arches over the windows and then the in inlaid that's above on the top. A lot of the brick building do show signs of mud flood. So you can see here these buried sorts of windows that are on the bottom with the archway that you saw kind of similar up at the top. So this is an example of, on the left-hand side, just the building actually goes pretty far down, but in the front part, which is on the right-hand side, you know, there's just seems to kind of end by the top of that window. Another thing that we find really fascinating is the cemeteries around New England. I'm not really too familiar with cemeteries in the other parts of the country, but 
ours tend to have a lot of these stone walls, granite slabs all over the, the cemetery. And a lot of them are from the revolutionary era. This one has a strange door in the front. And this doorway kind of leads us to believe that it's not actually part or intended to be part of the cemetery. I've seen other examples where doors in these older cemeteries are actually mud flooded and there's just like engraving saying that they're part of a tomb or something like that, but they're just clearly not. And again, we see this stonework that's kind of similar to the bridges. In the, this area, we have a lot of granite. And granite, as well as the brick, seem to be the two material that has been used to build any kind of structures. And this is the whole cemetery that you can see. And the stone wall just kind of leads along the bottom part in the front of the cemetery. And the cemetery is found in Dublin, New Hampshire, which is the town just west of Peterborough. And really oddly, there is remnants of this old structure in the cemetery. And there's a sign that says that it's the first meeting house. Yet, interestingly, I can't really seem to find any. I'm sure there are, but I can't seem to find any pictures of this building. And again, there's just really large sorts of boulders that are piled on top of each other. And this was another structure that we saw within the cemetery. And the cemetery was actually located kind of on the bottom of this larger hill area that has, as you can see, it's just has tons of stone over it so kind of leads us to believe that potentially this was kind of the remnants of uh, the meltdown and again a beautiful stone wall that's in the back of the cemetery and you can see there's a road in the middle of these two stone walls and oftentimes in New England you'll see that the stone walls go along these roads and you know we're led to believe that this was sort of the boundaries by the different farmland that existed back in the day and then not far from there kind of towards the top of that larger hill that I was alluding to earlier with all the stone on it if you take the road up there's this gigantic house and it definitely looks like it was left over from the Tartarian era with this beautiful brick masonry. So I'm not sure if there's actually two sorts of timelines going on. One consisting of this beautiful brick and the other consisting of the stone walls and the large stone structures that we see everywhere. It's another thought if those two time eras were actually together or if they were separately and this house has an absolutely beautiful view of Mount Monadnock on the other side. And heading further west is the city of Keene, where this absolutely monstrous stone arch bridge is found. It's part of the Cheshire Railroad Bridge, which, again, I don't know if which came first, the railroad or the bridge, or... Was the bridge, you know, built for the railroad or was this just part of a structure that was used? And on the picture on the right hand side, you can see this is a, actually a snapshot of the left hand side of the bridge with this concave shape. And we're seeing with a lot of this absolutely gorgeous kind of granite masonry that a lot of times there's just absolutely gorgeous circular shapes that are in these structures.
So the story goes that the bridge was designed specifically for the railroad, which was completed in 1847. But yet across the street and a little bit farther down, we also noticed this kind of this remnant area. So it kind of led us to believe that there was something definitely here that was much larger than what we're led to believe. And in Peterborough, this is the Episcopal Church that clearly has old world architecture. And we're told that it's completed in 1914, but yet we question too if that is really accurate. So what does completed actually mean? Does, because some of the parts do seem like there's some add-ons here as well. In this picture, you can see the gorgeous archway surrounding the door, and then above that, the beautifully shaped round window, and then further on, on the top of this, the spire, there's this, again, this like inlaid brickwork with that rectangular shape, the same that we saw in the other picture that had the brick masonry. The roof definitely had these old slates that you often see on houses that are well over 100 years old. I'm not really too familiar with slated roofs, but this was just a lovely feature on this old church. The building reminded me of one of those cross-shaped cathedrals right out of Europe, right out of Spain. And... Uh, the, the back had this rounded part that was just so pretty and typical of what we've been seeing with these old buildings. And this archway with the pillars on the left-hand side seemed to actually be a little bit newer than the interior of, of this section. So it did kind of seem to be an add-on to us. We're not really sure what, this, what the history is exactly. And these next pictures are taken in a town called Jaffrey, which is southwest of Peterborough in the same Anadnock region. And these are of what we're told is from an old mill. So we're told that this mill is from 1868 and that originally it was built for cotton wool and fabric, which a lot of the New England mills were known to uh, manufacture. And what really struck us was that this waterway, which we know that mills are built around canals and, and all of that, but this waterway just seemed to go straight through these two buildings. And you can see on the bottom that the stone here seems to appear to be melted. And then the remnant, like intact part of the building is above that. So this kind of led us to the theory that Possibly the mud flood was more protective than harmful for these buildings that brick, you know, when they get really hot, the best thing that are going to protect them is the water. Again, more example of this brick inlay that a lot of these buildings in New Hampshire seems to have. And the write-up on these mills indicates that this tower used to have a cupola that was on top of it that was removed sometime in the 20th century. And just speaking to some of the people here, this is actually an apartment building now, they were saying this tower is actually just an old elevator shaft. This is a picture of the tower from behind the building, and it does seem to be pretty obvious that there's something missing from the top of it. I don't know if it was definitely a cupola or if it was something else, but the other thing that's very typical of these brick buildings that we've noticed are on the, on the right-hand side, you can see like there's four metal, I don't know if they're copper, but 
some kind of ornaments on the buildings and we see these so much on these buildings here. This is the Jaffrey Public Library and said to have been dedicated in 1896. But again, just beautiful brickwork and archways above the windows and the door. So this is St. Patrick Parish in Jaffrey, and supposedly this was built by Farmer's Fieldstones at the turn of the century, but clearly there's some elements of old world architecture, especially seen with the tower and the arches around the windows. And then here you can see the side view of the church, and it does seem to appear to have some kind of mud flood element to it. This is a house across the street that just looked very old and it was made out of this granite slabs like we've seen in a lot of the um, architecture around the area. And then this stone wall was right in front of the house. A lot of these granite stones seem to have these tick marks or kind of inseams. I'm not really sure what that was about. I don't know if it was the way it was quarried or cut, but this is not specific to the stone wall, but we've seen this in many, many different instances. Traveling beyond Jaffrey, we come to this pond. It also seems to have this retaining wall that is brick and was clearly remnants of something from before. This brook was across the street, but what really kind of I noticed was these, you know, the brick wall that kind of surrounded the water. So I think there was something there before. And then continuing on down the street, we came across this church that had the similar brick masonry with the arches and the similar brickwork with evidence of mud flood towards the bottom of that. And then in the same parking lot, there was this large structure that was very uh, reminiscent of old New England churches or meeting houses that happened, but they also have this large spire on top of there as well. And this cemetery was behind the church or meeting house there and Again, we can see a funny sort of doorway on the left side. And then on the right side, there was this stone structure that seemed to cover up another doorway. And then just to leave you with this one last picture, this was from downtown Jaffrey. And you can see that there's clearly um, the old brickwork that we've seen in so many pictures, but this building off definitely seems to have some kind of facade on the front of it and in a lot of these New England towns we're seeing this all over the place that the brickwork seems to be covered up and hidden in different ways and this is one of them. We hope you enjoyed this video and we'd love to hear your comments and feedback and any thoughts that you have about what we've seen. Thank you so much for watching.